see all of you here on a bright evening with a cloudy outside. And we're very pleased at this uh, special program brought here by uh, our cousins. And to uh, start things off and introduce uh, Jesse, I'd like to uh, myself introduce my brother, Matt Harrison. Matt. My um, cousin Jesse and her husband David Harrisoff have come a very long distance to um, give this talk. They live in Caslow on a lake in British Columbia, about four hours north of Spokane. My son Carl Friedrich Harrisoff spends quite a lot of time with them. Uh, David and Jesse are retired English professors from Wayne State University. Uh, David's specialty in teaching was American Studies, and Jesse was in British literature with a concentration in the 19th century. And um, she's going to talk about uh, various members of our family um, tonight, with emphasis on uh, some of the women. Um, Jesse and um, Henry Brown, who's here, and myself, are kind of a trio that has been specializing in family genealogy. And we have some relatives in the past that have also done a lot of work on genealogy, uh, particularly Louis um, Harrisoff, the third person over there, and my aunt Agnes Harrisoff. And uh, so without further ado, um, here is uh, Jesse Harrisoff. to order around a man who's six foot seven tall. <laughs> He's very agreeable. Can you hear me? Yeah. The people at the back? Yeah. Yeah. Quite sure? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Nat. <laughs> Nat is going to point out two of the nine brothers and sisters uh, whose, whose families I will mainly be discussing tonight. Uh, this is um, John Brown uh, Francis Harrisoff. He is the um, eighth child out of nine in his uh, family. And one thing I think we have to say is that he is named after um, uh, a relative named John Brown Francis, uh, who was governor of Rhode Island in the 1830s. And uh, Henry Brown here is down from that family. And. Um, this is the oldest member of the family who lived to be 96 years old. Uh, this is James Harrisoff. This is him as a little boy. And uh, this is uh, him uh, around 1917. He lived to 1930. Uh, one other quick comment is that uh, uh, the founder of our company here was John Brown Harrisoff. So uh, his younger brother simply had the same name but added the name Francis. There was no imagination in that time. <laughs> John Brown of the province. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Nat. I've, um, I've been writing, a, I guess you might call it a saga of certain family members, and I've been treading on dangerous ground with my husband for a number of years because I, um, I write biographies. I, my dissertation I managed to turn my dissertation into what I thought was quite an amusing biography, and that's no mean trick when you're trying to get a PhD. <laughs> um, but writing this one has been could have been rather delicate, except my husband said, say anything you like, anything you like. <laughs> and he, in fact, has not read any of it. <laughs> but he will read it before I send it out. Um, and I'm hoping by the end of this year it will be ready to go to an editor if I can find one. Now, I thought I was working in uncharted territory with, uh, with one exception. I knew a wonderful gentleman from Washington and Lee University um, 
named James Whitehead, who had a fascinating story to tell about inheriting all of the treasures and wealth of J.B. Francis Harrisoff's oldest daughter, Louise. And I'd known about the story for years, and when he and I finally met each other at Washington and Lee, when I was there to discuss my Harrisoffs there, we discovered that one of the Harrisoffs we both were working on <coughs> was Louise. And so he and I have had a ladies and gentlemen's agreement ever since, which neither one of us has broken, that he would go for Louise and I would seize the rest between my teeth and shake them. And, um, and then I heard nothing from him oh, for over a year, and he's a very elderly gentleman by now, and I thought, oh, I hope nothing's happened to Jim. And about three weeks ago, this arrived in the mail. And this is James Whitehead's marvelous biography of Louise Harrisoff. And um, I believe, Palsy, am I correct, that uh, the museum has received one or two copies? Does it, does, do you know Elizabeth? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, because this is, for a biographer, this is a very thrilling moment to hold someone else's book like this and find that one of the main characters is a woman I've been writing about myself for years. And I just wanted to um, read a little part of, from the introduction, <coughs> the foreword, and it was written by Tom Wolfe, you know, the famous American author. <coughs> What's his last book? <coughs> a Man for. A Man in Fool, and the one before that, Bonfire of the Vanities. Um, I was the only one time when my husband read me the Bonfire of the Vanities every night before I went to sleep. <laughs> and so um, Tom Wolfe is an old boy from Washington and Lee, and he wrote the foreword. And um, one of the first people to come and see Louise's paintings after they were discovered was Senator John Warner, whom I'm sure you've all been watching on television recently, who chaired that marvelous committee investigating what happened in Iraq. And, uh, and he brought with him his then wife, Elizabeth Taylor. And so it caused quite a stir at Washington and Lee when these two showed up to see Louise's <coughs> porcelains and paintings. And believe me, if I could grab either one of them, preferably Senator John Warner, I would, so we'll see what <laughs> <laughs> so here's what Tom Wolfe said, and believe me, I can agree with every word of this. Dickens, can you still hear me? Mm -hmm. Dickens would have gladly died and gone to heaven if only he could have written the story awaiting us in the pages that follow. Dickens is stock and trade with a child who grows up orphaned in a callous world, such as Pimp and Great Expectations. The little boy we meet in the novel's famous first chapter, chapter in a graveyard at twilight whimpering over the tombstones of his father and his mother and his five brothers who died in infancy. The heroine of a, of a fragile union, this book, our little Louise, out pips Pip right down to the last detail. She has been orphaned not merely by death, but also by an insidious piece of moral extortion that does not come to light for decades. A la Pip, we meet Louise in the first chapter, bereft before a tomb at night, in a graveyard scene, the first of many in fact, compared to which Pips is the annual flower drop at the cemetery after Easter service. And so it goes on and then he says something which struck home both to David and myself as 19th century literary types. If Edith Wharton could have dreamed up the story herein, she would have been rendered spastic by a eurekish euphoria on the one hand, I found it, and on the other, fear two kinds of it. Would even her surpassing talent be equal to the telling of so rich and Byzantine a tale? And how about her readers? They are liable to think she'd gone hog wild with hubris and manufactured a story so implausible it insulted their intelligence. Now, I don't mean to say my Wharton and Dickens stuff is better than that, or even as good as that, but it's certainly as implausible as that. And tonight, I only have time to touch the mere surface, just enough to give you a little flavor. But there are parts of my book which I'm sure people would absolutely refuse to believe. 
And that's the kind of material biographers like to work with. Now, we'll start off tonight by looking at this lady up here. And she is my mother-in-law. And this is Constance Mills, Constance Sprague Mills, who became James Brown Harrisoff's wife. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. Now, this is a portrait of Louise taken around 19... Six, I think, but there's, there could be an argument about that. Doesn't matter. And she, with this portrait, was painted by uh, Lazar Raditz, who painted those people over there. And uh, of course, Raditz painted J. B. Francis Harrisoff and Lewis and all of the rest of the, the gang. And he commissioned him to paint his daughter Louise. So that's Louise painted by Raditz. And the original of that hangs at the Reeves Center in Washington and Lee. And the Reeves Center, her, her second marriage name was Reeves. The Reeves Center was built by the university there as the most magnificent place. Um, the thing that boggles my mind is it looked perfect to me a few years ago, but recently we spent a fortune putting a copper roof on it. So the Reeves Center would blend in with the rest of the campus. And you can imagine how much a copper roof cost. So that's Louise, and could we have the next one, please? Now, this, of all the portraits Louise painted, this is one of hers. This is the one I am told that more people look at longer than any other of her works. Um, and some of her portraits are marvelous. But this is her little sister, Sarah. It was painted when Sarah was 10. Um, the portrait is called Sarah Unfinished, and, and the Reef Center people have wisely titled it Sarah Unfinished, and it appears in all the catalogs and brochures they put out, and people always want to know why was it unfinished. I happened to read a letter written by Carrie, this is my big cousin here, Caroline, to Lewis. All of these siblings wrote to each other constantly, sometimes several times a day. I mean, there was no, no, no other no means of communication <laughs> much at the time. Um, Carrie's writing to Lewis in one of those kind of annoyed ways that family members do when some other family members just really irritated them. <laughs> and it was J.B. Francis's wife, Emily, had written to Carrie, and Carrie at that time was taking care of some quite elderly re relatives who lived next door. Carrie was being asked to take Sarah in because Sarah had typhoid fever. Now, I don't think there's a person in this room who would take anybody in who had typhoid fever. And Carrie, of course, refused. And then Emily asked her again, and Carrie again refused. And, um, and the letter's really quite a remarkable letter. She was a, a woman who spoke her mind and wrote her mind, and she was very exact in her adjectives and adverbs describing this ridiculous request. Now, we don't know what happened to Sarah, but she, except that she recovered. So maybe some other relative took her. I don't know, maybe Nat's ancestor or somebody took her in, but Carrie refused to take her. But she did recover, which was quite remarkable. And Louise decided not to finish the portrait. Now, I think it was because when she looked at it again, she realized that this was good this way. It was, it was becoming a more contemporary kind of portrait where you don't have everything to the last little buttonhole and so on. So that is Sarah. Now, I'm going to be talking about the interconnectedness of some of the women tonight, particularly Louise and the first one you saw, Constance, but Sarah also plays a role. Now there is one other, the next slide I would like to show is a lady who was a kind of a go-between in a romance, among other things. That's Grace. This is, um, this is Constance's sister, Grace Mills. 
and it's painted by Louise, and it was painted, we believe, around 1904, 1905. I think it was 1904. She's, uh, Louise is still in her earlier period, more conventional portraits. Uh, later, she advanced through every phase of the, the French period, right up to what you would call extremely avant-garde for the time. Um, it, it's typical in that it's it's painted so as to be slightly sh um, hazy and romantic, and uh, and Louise was very fond of this particular pose where you see the back of the subject, but then you also see the expression and you see the hands and the hair, and, and it's 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 a wonderful way to paint a portrait, I think. Grace and Louise became friends, possibly because they were temperamentally suited to each other, but it was also partly because Louise wanted to have a close connection to Constance without being a particular friend of her, because they were both in love with the same man. Constance and Louise, for much of their lives, were in love with James Brown Hare herself, and I think we have a shot of him. <laughs> Here he is. Um, I call this one Soulful James, you might agree with me. <laughs> I shouldn't be too flippant about this gentleman because he's my father-in-law. <laughs> but he's one of the most handsome men I've ever seen in my life. In, in his photographs, I never met him. Could we have the next one? Two of the women being discussed tonight had a kind of a childlike side to them that you wouldn't expect. Um, Constance must have been about 20 or 21 here, and she's clowning for one of those street photographers where you go into a little booth and, the, the, you know, they put the cover over, at least they used to at the turn of the 20th century, and you can see she's putting her hat on, taking her hat off, and making faces and looking solemn and malarkying around here. Now, when I was going through James Brown Harris of Junior's papers after his oldest son died, uh, his oldest son gave me the big box with James's business correspondence in it. But inside one envelope, which was addressed in Grace's handwriting to James about seven days before James married Constance, inside that envelope is a triptych of Louise, except Louise isn't clowning. Louise is very serious and soulful looking. Uh, and in fact, she looks very wistful and unhappy. And we don't know whether there was a letter in that envelope or not, but just a few weeks ago, I was going through some old theater bills and theater material of Grace, which my husband gave to me <coughs> years ago. And I discovered that Grace was uh, performing a Shakespeare play in Atlantic City that week, and that Louise was also in Atlantic City that week, staying in the same hotel Grace was in. And so the two young women, who were close friends, were having a few days in Atlantic City. And the handwriting on the envelope was Grace's writing. And I think that Louise got Grace to address the envelope just so James's parents wouldn't know what was going on. And uh, I'm sure there must have been some kind of a little farewell note then, or maybe I'm just being over the top here, but I think that's what happened. Okay. Uh, and talking about fooling around and, and having fun when you're supposed to be serious. The morning of James and Constance's wedding, they all, she and James and her two younger brothers, who were teenagers at the time, went up into the mesa above their home in um, San Diego to pick uh, greenery and shrubs for the wedding decorations. And she mentions that they had foot races. Now I don't know whether she was running up and down or whether it was the boys, but uh, they were having a good time running up and down. And I like to think that was the time this photograph was taken, but I can't prove it, but it could have been. You see, she's, she's pointing to a big cactus there. Well, 
her, her nickname from her early teens, and she had it all of her life, was Cactus Connie, because she had a very sharp tongue, but she didn't use it to destroy people, she used it wittily. But some of the boyfriends and the older relatives didn't relish it too much, so she was called Cactus Connie, and um, I would have been proud to have that name, but you know what, this was 1904, so... 19.6. So she is making fun of herself here by pointing to the cactus and either James or one of her brothers is taking a photograph. I think she was a really spunky woman for her time. All right, Elizabeth. Now, this is another shot of, of uh, James and um, I call him Bridegroom James there because this was his wedding photograph. Um, I think he's got the very best nose of all the hairy socks I've ever met. <laughs> well, maybe horses is good, but... <laughs> the hairy sock men are... No I mean, look at those over there. Look at those noses over there. <laughs> when I finish talking, go and have a look at their noses. <laughs> so I would like uh, to jump now to a little reading. My niece, Susan Bryson, who is Constance's granddaughter, is going to read Constance's own account of the day before the wedding, the wedding and how she felt and all the dresses and everything so the men can have a little sleep while this is going on. <laughs> but the reason I included it wasn't to put in a, a thing about how many frills were on the sleeve of a garment. It's uh, because later on um, Karen is going to read a description of Louise's wedding which just turned up very recently. And I wanted you to see the contrast between the two styles of wedding. So, Karen, you're on now. Susan or Karen, do you want Connie's wedding or? I want Connie's, Connie's wedding. wedding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this was written February 7th, 1906 by Constance. We expected Jim to reach San Diego Tuesday evening, January 9th, but he telegraphed me from the Needles that his train was five hours late. Finally, it was time to start, and instead of taking a streetcar, I fairly flew down the hill to the depot. The whole eastern sky over the mountains was a lovely, hopeful rose cloud. I could see Jim's train inching along at Pacific Beach, moving at a snail's pace. Finally, it drew into the station, and my Jim stepped off. I was surprised when he kissed me, for he had never before done such an act publicly. We rode home silently in a closed carriage and were greeted at the door by the family and by all the neighbors behind their curtains. <laughs> Young Albert greeted Jim without a word. He had threatened to get out of bail on him if Jim did not come out for the wedding. <laughs> After lunch, Father took us down to the courthouse to get our license. Cupid, who was the clerk who issued marriage licenses. <laughs> Cupid's story fixed it up in a back room and told us never to let it happen again. Jim was very brave. Neither of us were embarrassed as we expected to be. On Thursday, January 11th, the morning of the wedding, we got up about six o'clock. Jim, Henry, Albert, and I went up to the Mesa for the sunrise and running races. Then, after breakfast, we set out to the business of our decorations. While we gathered flowers, the telegrams of good wishes and congratulations began to arrive. Miss Waltz and Uncle Francis Harrisoffs were the first to arrive. Then others followed. Mr. and Mrs. McDowell and the Boys Club of the Music School Settlement. Jim began dressing at 10. He was cold and lonely and interminably slow. I know not what remorse and regrets were preying upon him in these two hours before the ceremony. But he was the picture of misery every time I caught a glimpse of him at the door. Edith, Grace, and I dressed in Grace's room together. My dress was white radium silk, bought at John Wanamaker's, as soft and lovely and sheeny as I have ever seen. Mother sheared five beautiful rows on the skirt, also the shearing on the sleeves. I sewed the seams to the skirt and Mrs. Allen did the rest. The dress was made surplus style, the skirt full and perfectly plain, without a train, 
I wore no veil, and her flowers had only a few orange blossoms in my belt. It never occurred to Jim to give me a bouquet, and I wouldn't let anyone else give me one, so there wasn't any. I carried a single beautiful yellow rose in my hand. Jim wore a black suit we had bought together at Brooks. Edith gave him his white tie, Grace's handkerchief embroidered in his initials, and his scarf pin was the little ship's anchor pin I gave him at the time of our engagement. He also wore, at my request, a pair of delightfully shiny shoes. Henry and Albert were splendid in new suits of clothes and shiny shoes. Albert was particularly solemn and official. He stepped high and lightly in his new dress shoes with the silent, important manner of a funeral director. <laughs> Mother looked young and lovely in the old rose silk and her silk Venetian lace. Father's costume escapes me, but it was appropriate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, Constance was a good writer, but at that time in her life, she was still um, young and uh, life hadn't been so terribly hard on her. Later on, when she was a very well-known music and drama critic for the big San Diego daily newspaper, for over 30 years until she was into her 80s, some of her columns are particularly witty and incisive, and she knew how to cut through bluster and cut people down to size. So imagine Cactus Connie with a pen, and that's the kind of <laughs> writer she was. But she, she wasn't unkind to people. Some of it, I don't think there's going to be time tonight, but some of, some of her newspaper clip, clippings are absolutely hilarious. And, uh, I, have, I believe I have virtually all of the, the articles she ever wrote for the two San Diego newspapers over a period of almost 35 years, thanks to a particularly good archivist who is meticulous in everything he does. And he went to San Diego and spent three weeks sweating away at the newspaper archives, working with old, old microfilm and microfiche, and unlike some microfilm we've read about in the papers recently. This wasn't disintegrating or destroyed, it was still readable. And he he managed to um, recreate good copies of everything. And that was Carl herself, Matt's youngest child. And uh, if you ever need someone to do meticulous, finicky work, he's the boy for you. Um, now, so you understand the, the dramatic setup here. We have uh, Louise and Constance, both in love with James. And unfortunately, James is in love with both of them. He never quite gets over Louise in the years to come. And this is, there isn't time to go into the story, but just to put you out of suspense, um, many years later, after many ups and downs, um, James and Constance were divorced in 1940. And a few months later, James took his youngest son, who had just finished high school, and they got in his old car. I wish I could say it was the Harrisoft car, but I think it was a, an old, I don't know what kind of car. And uh, on the way back east, they stopped and spent two nights with the fourth widow of J.B. Francis Harrisoft, who lived in a big old mansion in Atlanta. It was a very wealthy lady because she had inherited not only uh, whatever came to her when J.D. Francis died, but he had, wife number three was her sister. Mm -hmm. And when the sister died, she left the sister all of her share of, of the, the J.D. Francis money. And, um, and so James was stopping in to spend a couple of nights with widow number four. And uh, Constance and James's youngest son told me one time that he was in a big four-poster bed and he couldn't sleep because it smelled moldy and damp, but it was obviously a wonderful antique. And for both of the nights he was there, you could hear his father and J.B. Francis, his fourth widow, having long, earnest conversations about 
I would probably say money and whether she would help him to persuade Louise to marry him because he had already heard that Louise was thinking of marrying a 38 year old man with not a penny to his name who had no job but who was charming and good looking and Louise at that time was, uh, I believe, 66 or 67. <laughs> so you might say that James had the right motives or the wrong motives, but you must remember that he had, he had been, had a thing about her all of his life, and I suppose he was divorced now, and he thought maybe he might as well have a share of the Harris of money as well. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what happens. So, um, could we have the next photograph? Well, these, this is the wedding gown that was just described. This is um, Susan and um, Stephen's mother, who is Constance's daughter, wearing the wedding gown that was described in that old letter. And can we have a look at the other? And you can see the, the I call it shearing, but, but shearing of whatever, down the sleeves and so on. This was a wedding where the the aunt, the, the sisters, and the mother all contributed to making a, the wedding gown at home. So it was beautiful but inexpensive, except for the fabric from Wanamakers or whatever. Okay, and uh, could we have the next one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to jump now to the description of another wedding, which is Louise's wedding. Um, James and Constance were married in 19, the first January 1907, and Louise was married in the, the last week of December 1910. Now one of the reasons that the family, um, one of the reasons they gave for disapproving of the marriage of James and Louise was you may remember somebody mentioning that four of these nine siblings were blind. I think it's a well-known fact around Bristol. Four of them were blind. And for many, many generations, almost since they, you know, they landed in the New World, this family and families like them in this part of New England tended to tried to keep the wealth in the family and the best way to do it was by marrying a cousin to a cousin or a cousin to a second cousin. And uh, this was expected, families just did this, but by the time of this generation, um, particularly J.B. Francis who doted on his, his daughters, um, and James, who, uh, James Senior, who, both of these men, by the way, were scientists and they were keeping up with the latest genetic uh, research being done and they read widely in all of the scientific papers. They, they strongly felt that James and Louise should not marry. Now, uh, in 1910, Louise married a cousin. His name was Charles Eaton and he wasn't a first cousin and I'm not going to get in a, into a dispute with Nat over here about whether it was second cousin once removed, or first cousin twice removed, <laughs> but it was a cousin, right. And, uh, and I think that's a great irony here because um, I'm going to read you, if <clears throat> my voice holds out, I'm going to read you a description of the wedding. It's uh, a classic of its kind. I can find it. Do I have it? You have it. <laughs> <laughs> Which two? When they got married. Constance first. And James? And James. Um, Constance was 25 and James was 27. And Louise? Louise was four years old, uh, three years older than James. Okay. okay. This was a, a letter written to Sally Harrisoff in Bristol, but I don't know who Sally Harrisoff is. Did everybody hear this? Mm -hmm. Does anyone know yes. who Sally Harrisoff She's the blind lady over there. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And this was written by some cousins who had attended Louise's wedding. It was written on December 12, 1910. And uh, the cousins had lived in New York City because there's an address of 75th East 75th Street here. 
My dear Sally, I wanted so much to get this off to you yesterday to bring you the first description of Louise's beautiful wedding, but I was so often interrupted I had to wait for today. <clears throat> Lila, Lila, and I Lila. plan to get to the house in time for an, uh, enough for a cozy old chat with some of you dear people, but with the exception of James, his wife and daughters met none of our Bristol cousins, much to our disappointment, as you can well understand. James looked rather more delicate than we liked, but his wife more buxom than ever. <laughs> we were met at the head of the broad staircase by Miss Dyer, beautifully dressed in a lavender satin with a superb bouquet of orchids, the same color, very cordial and warm, and then our dear Francis looking stunning and overflowing with kindness and hospitality. The house, big as it was, was fairly covered with trailing vines and masses of the most beautiful white roses you can imagine. In the front room was a large canopy of nothing but superb white roses and greens, and under this the happy couple were married, passing through a lane fenced off with white satin ribbon and great sheaves of roses. Could anything be lovelier? The supper, most elaborate and fine music by a stringed <coughs> orchestra, sitting in an anteroom all decorated and hung with greens. We were told Louise chose the program and much of the music by Bach. The supper was served on small tables, seating four, and no end of courses. The presents were very handsome, of course, in a room by themselves. Louise looked very happy and most exquisitely dressed. We liked the bridegroom's looks very much, and nothing could have been more reverent and appreciative than the earnest attention both bride and groom gave to the marriage service, which was most impressively rendered by the clergyman, and in which all present seemed to participate. We felt that every person there was a warm personal friend of the couple, and most sincere in their congratulations. We were glad to see Francis Lee and Fred both looking well, and Mildred like a beautiful picture so handsome and picturesque in her perfect dress, dress most becoming. I really longed for her portrait to be painted. She was a model hostess, most attentive to every guest and making all feel at home. We were very proud of her. Norman had a beautiful time clad in a white sailor suit a white rose in his buttonhole, and white gloves. He certainly looked very cunning. We were so glad we went, and shall always look back on Louise's marriage as a very happy occasion to remember. That's very good, because this lady didn't know she was going to read this when she walked in here. <laughs> um, now this is the beautiful Mildred, and this is cunning little Norman. <laughs> and I don't know whether the museum has a copy of that or not, but I'd be happy to leave one when I go. Uh, he isn't wearing the white sailor suit there. I would say this was probably taken about two years after this description. He's a little bit older. <coughs> he, Norman, was the son of, was the grandson of uh, J.B. Francis. Mm -hmm and his father's name was also Francis. This, this family seems to use the same few names all the time, except Halsey. Halsey has a unique name in the family. But all of the rest of them have the same names, and, and when they have girls, they just feminize the male <laughs> names. This was pointed out to me by Nat. Yes? But it happened to you. No, it didn't happen to you. <laughs> But, it, but in this talk, we aren't going by 1967. <laughs> we aren't going that far tonight. Okay. Um, I think at some point I get to read a letter, but we've been playing musical chairs since we discovered uh, Frida wouldn't be with us tonight. I'm not sure when I'm on. Um, let's just go, go to the next photograph. Now, this, believe it or not, was Constance's working clothes. I haven't actually mentioned that this lady 
um, had several careers, and I don't believe I've even told you what she did. Constance, it boggles the mind, but when she was 14, uh, a man called Alfred Robin, who was a, a very close friend of a man called Dan Roche, who founded the New York Philharmonic. And Dan Roche went around the country looking for musical talent. Dan Roche was in, in, Louis, in um, St. Louis one week, uh, scouting for prodigies, more or less. And Alfred Robin told him about a very brilliant student he had who was 14 years old and who was already concertizing, was a composer, and had a good understanding of counterpoint. So Dan Roche said, well, that's kind of hard to believe. And he, so he met Constance. Constance was the, 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 the pianist. As soon as he heard her, he realized that this was an exceptional, a gifted, a very personable and very self-assured kid. And so he went back to New York and talked her up around town and mentioned her to Edward McDowell, who's one of your country's greatest composers. He was avant-garde for his time. I'm sure you've all heard some of his some of his work is of course still performed. He was also one of the foremost teachers in the United States. He had uh, done his musical education in Germany and uh, and was a very big name indeed in New York circles. McDowell said he would be willing to hear this girl and um, Constance went, I'm not positive about this, but I think her mother took her to New York. Um, her mother was also a musician, although she didn't compose, but her son told, her grandson told me she wrote the most dreadful poetry you have ever heard in your life. <laughs> and uh, they, went, they went to New York and Constance auditioned for Edward McDowell. And he said he would like to work with Robin and Dan Roche and you know and himself to work out a program of study for Constance. So Constance with her mother went back to St. Louis and shortly a couple of years after that, three years after that they moved to San Diego. Now all this time Constance knew that she was being um, educated long distance so to speak by those three eminent American uh, musicians and composers. And, and she relished this, she, she was very much a dedicated uh, student. Um, but she had a, she had a well-rounded education and she wasn't one of those people who are shut up in an attic and they don't socialize and they don't do anything but whatever their fanaticism is. Mm -hmm. She was well-rounded. So when she was 20, her parents permitted to go alone to New York City. Now, in 1900, this is not what you would do with a 20-year-old girl you had nurtured and cared for all your life because everybody outside New York knew it was a, a, a hellhole, to put it politely. She went there and, and um, was the first woman student at Columbia to board in the, the new college uh, building they had for young ladies. Young ladies were only permitted to take ladylike courses, but then, of course, music was considered ladylike and they didn't know she was studying mathematics and counterpoint and male stuff um, because Edward McDowell insisted she must have a good grounding in mathematics in order to compose and if there may be musicians here who, who agree with that. So she was the first woman to study mathematics at that level at Columbia and, uh, and I have her letters where she's mourning and groaning over how hard she has to work to bring her math up to standard, but she did it. Um, after the first year, McDowell said he would, he would continue to work with her as long as she wished to be his student. Now, the Mills family were middle class and they, they had, both of her parents came from people who came over on one of those boats from my part of the the Atlantic in the 16, late 1620s. Uh, but over the years, um, the Mills fortunes had uh, been severely affected by her father's tuberculosis. 
he was a lawyer, but the, for some years he was unable to, to work and, and uh, medical fees and traveling around trying to find a cure. So the family didn't have too much excess money um, to keep Constance uh, in New York. But the Mills family had always worked with, with what was called the poor in those days. Uh, they were strict Baptists. They believed they were sent into the world to do good works. And uh, so Constance was introduced to Lillian Wald. And Lillian Wald was one of the very great, famous American women. I mean, I think if St. Hood was, was conferred on a, an American woman, Lillian Wald should be the first one to get it. She founded the public health system for the whole of the United States. She, she pounded politicians' doors, trying to get them to understand that if they didn't do something about the dreadful conditions in the New York slums at the turn of the century, then that New York would become another London. And, and if any of you have read Dickens, particularly Bleak House, Dickens wrote Bleak House to point out to wealthy English people that there was no point in them trying to separate themselves from viruses and germs because those kind of critters don't know class barriers. <laughs> and, uh, and that was what you know, started the movement to, to provide uh, sanitary housing for the poor. Lillian Wald was an extremely wealthy philanthropist. She was a very close friend, friend of Theodore Roosevelt, and she was also a very close friend of the most marvelous American, Jacob Rees. Jacob Rees, this is his most famous book, but he wrote many. He wrote this, How the Other Half Lives. He and Teddy Roosevelt, between them, they, they worked as a team. Uh, for a time, Teddy Roosevelt was the police commissioner in New York, and that's when he met Jacob Rees. After I've finished speechifying here, you might like to look at some of the illustrations in this book. He, um, he wasn't a photographer to begin with, but he realized that when photography was making it, the advances it was making, that this would be much better than drawing the pictures for the newspaper. So as he wrote his articles about the crime and, the, and everything going on in, in New York City, he was teaching himself how to become a good photographer. And in some circles, like photography circles, he's known first as a famous American photographer. His images sell for a great deal of money now, and only secondly, for the, for the articles he wrote every day almost for the New York papers. So Constance went to work for Lillian Wald in the Henry Street settlement. And before too many months had gone by, she was able to persuade her very strict parents to send Grace and Edith to New York. They were both very gifted women also. And these three young sis these three sisters worked with, people were coming off the boats, I think it was 400 an hour at one time. And while they were in New York, the, the ethnic cleansing was going on in Russia. The, the villages were being burnt and the people forced to leave the country. They were landing in the country was maybe $10 or less. Um, some of the children who were taken in off the street you may have heard of before. For example, the Marx brothers. The Marx brothers came to the settlement house. There were several of the ones in a cluster of streets. And there they learned how, they learned how to read music. Well, of course, the Marx brothers were marvelous at everything, but they were given formal education in all of these things. And later on, Isaac Stern, the famous violinist who died just a few couple of years ago, he was one of the street waves who was taken in and thanks to Lillian Wald, uh, received a marvelous education. So that's what these three sisters did. Now, this, this particular aspect deserves much more than I'm giving it right now, but just to bear in mind that Lillian Wald, Jacob Rees, and Theodore Roosevelt were working as a threesome towards the same end. Um, when Reese's daughter was being married, by that time Teddy Roosevelt was president of the United States. He came from Washington to New York to attend the girl's wedding. And the next door neighbors, next door neighbors to the to the Reese's for years were James and Constance Harrisoff. 
That was how Constance became so very friendly with Mr. and Mrs. Rees. They were so friendly that when the Reeses moved to another part of town, Constance and James moved with them and, had, and bought, bought a house next door. Um, a few years later, Mr. Rees had, uh, by this time he was rather wealthy, he had a summer place in Massachusetts, I've forgotten the location, but it was very beautiful, and he gave Constance and James several acres as a gift because he wanted them to build their summer cottage next door. Very nice. Very Massachusetts. And so not only were they living together in the city, but they were next door to each other in Barry, Massachusetts. So that's, that was the connection. Um, I'm going to show, I hope it's the next slide, because it might not be, but we happen to have an original photograph that James Reese took of Constance. And the house behind Constance is the Reese house, and, and the Harrisoff house was just to the right of the photograph. And uh, this was Constance around the age of 40 or 41. And this is Sandy the dog. And uh, if Sandy the dog hadn't pulled a little toddler out of the brook at Barry, Massachusetts one summer, I might not have a husband today. <laughs> uh, can we back up, Elizabeth? It's wonderful having a, someone who's a techie over here. Um, what time is it now? Almost, my time's almost up. Okay. I'll take a few more minutes if that's okay. You've got to say yes. <laughs> um, okay, I get, I get to read a letter now. And we're almost at the end of the program. I chose this particular one. There were hundreds I could have chosen. I think I have over 400 letters written by to Constance and her friends, our circle in New York, and the people she knew in San Diego. She knew everybody who was anybody. So here is young Constance, still, uh, still somewhat naive, um, and uh, it's the year after her marriage. James been itching to take her to Bristol, but um, being a proper husband, he wasn't about to take her when she was pregnant. And so she had to wait till the baby was born before she could go out into society, and that was how it was in those days. So the baby has been born safely, named, I bet you could guess what the name would be. <laughs> James Brown Harris of the Third. Years later, they had James Brown Harris of the Fourth. And James Brown Harris of the Fourth is famous because he was the only graduate student at MIT and also at Berkeley who won the Putnam Medal for Mathematics three years in a row. He was better at maths than Constance was. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> we left New York. This is dated July the 8th, 1907. We left New York Wednesday, July the 3rd. The baby was much pleased with her first streetcar ride and seemed to enjoy everything while we were away, but the steamer whistle, which frightened her very much. We left New York on the Neptune Line boat Connecticut, reaching Fall River about 6 a.m. July the 4th. We took the electric cars from there to war and riding in sight of water most of the way, pleasant salt water inlets and fancy shaped bays running up into green meadows. Many people were up to their knees in water poking up clams. From Warren we took a trolley to Bristol passing exquisite woodlands along streets roofed in green elms. The sight of yards and shade trees and homes delighted one after a year of New York's asphalt and apartment houses. As we rode in the trolley, we enjoyed tunes from brass bands going to Bristol to celebrate the 4th. I hope it wasn't as wet as it was. <laughs> when they weren't shooting their horns, they were shooting their pistols and making a fearful racket. At the end of the trolley, we were met by Aunt Carrie and Uncle Lewis and a baby carriage. And then in parenthesis, Constance has written Rotten Row. Now, have any of you been tourists in London and walked in the park and gone to that particular part of the park, which is called the Rotten Row? Oh, 
Thank you, thank you, Nat. <laughs> that was where the aristocracy rode the carriages up and down and dressed in their finest clothes and looked at how their rivals were doing in their carriages. And it was still safe enough then for Queen Victoria to ride up and down in her carriage, uh, which she did most Sundays. Um, it was a normal thing. The London people didn't bother her. Of course, everyone knew they couldn't approach the carriage, but they could stand at a respectful distance and wave a little Union Jack. You know. One time, James and his buxom wife, Jane, with their young family, were walking with their baby carriage in Rotten Row. Now, I don't know whether Natter Halsey mentioned, but, but he was one of the inventor Herisovs, and he invented serious things, important things, and silly things. Um, Halsey had a wonderful cartoon of him made some years ago for a talk in which he's writing his, one of his inventions with his beard flying, and he's, he's on fire, his legs are on fire, and he's heading down, right down in front of here, was it? Down at the bottom of the street. It was, it was a steam cycle he had invented. <laughs> um, and it, well, it, was, it, it worked in the sense that it went quite fast, but his, uh, it was hot for his legs down there, so he wrapped them in, of all things, newspapers, <laughs> and they caught fire. And he, he had to make a right turn and go right down into the water. And have, yeah. One of the other things he invented, they had lots of babies in quick succession, um, his wife was always out, and the nurse, nursemaid was out because they couldn't get the toddler and the baby and the pram at the, same, the buggy at the same time. <clears throat> and so he invented a folding baby buggy which could take an infant and a toddler. And Queen Victoria saw James and Buxom Jane, and I think James Brown Harrisoff Jr. and his little brother Charles in this buggy. And Queen Victoria had lots of children and grandchildren, and she'd never seen a contraption like this before, and I can only imagine what it looked like. And so she sent one of the side riders on his horse over to James, presented the Queen's compliments, and said Her Majesty would like to know where he had purchased this intriguing, the British call it, folding pram. pram. And James said, um, well, um, I made it. Uh, you might tell Her Majesty, and I made the babies also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor old Jane got no credit. <laughs> so the Queen was given this message, and she sent some, the, a footman back to the, the, the young Harrisovs and invited the, them to come over and be introduced. Mm -hmm. And they went over and they were introduced. And so the buggy that was being brought for James Jr. and Constance's first baby was, was rotten row. In other words, it had been brought back to Bristol and they were taking it out of storage because they never threw anything away. Everything was in the attic somewhere. And so they had brought it out and that's what met the young couple I'm talking about here. Now, for years, I'd heard this story for years. Maybe Matt told me it. It pops up in some of the, the less accurate biographies of previous Harrisoffs, and I always thought it was a tall tale. But when I came across this letter, I was converted because Constance calls it rotten roll. Yeah. Um, so, so they get the buggy. So we met Uncle Lewis with the baby carriage, rotten roll. A block away we met blind Aunt Sally, who came out smiling to meet us. The house where Aunt Sally and Uncle Lewis live is 142 Hope Street. A plain ground frame house, is it that way or this way? Over there. Um, a plain ground... Bear with me here, I've just did cataract surgery. Um, where James' grandmother and her children lived for so many years. Across the street there is a bay, across which one, one can see Popish Squash Point and the old Harrisoff homestead. Aunt Carrie Chesborough's big house and pretty yard are next door, so I believe that's next door to the Norman's house. Now, I didn't know this. Governor Bourne's house next to that, is that correct? That's the Gothic mansion. 
Oh, is that uh, Governor Jones' house next to that, and across from that, Uncle Matt Herself's home, the Love Rocks, so-called because its point of rocks was formerly the favorite coaching place of the village. At Aunt Sally's, we had the big bedroom and the ground floor as a joining small bedroom for the baby and a bathroom. We were very comfortably fixed. We began to meet the relatives right away, and I suggest that crowd over on that side listen, listen carefully now. <laughs> They're not my relatives, they're yours. Um, first, blind Uncle Julian and his daughter Grace, who were staying at Aunt Carrie's. Then we walked down to the Love Rocks and saw Uncle Nat's beautiful steam launch, the Roamer, and his fine family of children, all in yachting white. Agnes, the oldest, and his boys, Sydney, Nat, Griswold, Francis, and small Clarence, and the aunt, Miss Flossie de Wolf. The Love Rocks is a prosperous looking place, trim, clean, and ship shape. After lunch, we went to the village square to see something of the 4th of July. Young Nat, that is Nat Herisoff's son, Nat. Young Nat had recited the Declaration of Independence and had won most of the athletic contests. Later in the afternoon, we saw the Parade of Ancients and Horribles, an annual feature of the Bristol 4th. <laughs> The Bristol Harrison. Nat appeared as the devil all in red. Now, Halsey, I don't think that was your grandfather. I don't think it was your uncle. <laughs> that was Clara Natalie's father. Right, but it's not. Nat it's all Julie. Nat. No, okay. The first time I read it, I thought it was the other. Uh, late in the afternoon, and had won most of the contests. Uh, okay. Nat appeared as the devil all in red. He astonished all by shooting fire from his mouth. This was done by taking kerosene in his mouth and blowing it on a flame. <laughs> that was a crazy thing to do. <laughs> if I had been Mrs. Nat, I wouldn't have permitted him. He was ill after this, and a week or so later had scarlet fever. Now, the sad thing about this is, I just heard the other day that when Nat died, he was young, and he died of pneumonia. And there was another letter written a couple in, the, there was a 1909 letter, this is the 1907 fourth. In 1909, I think what he did was he was in the water and he jumped up in the water and blew flame yeah. some way down at the dock. Henry, did you ever hear that one? No? I think I have the letter. Um, and so, Nat and Sydney are preparing to enter Boston Tech this fall, who became known as MIT later. All the Nat boys are eternally shooting, shooting past the house in autos, motorcycles, on horseback, or in motorboats. I never saw such continual travel. That afternoon we met cousin Albert Chesbrough. Are there any descendants of Albert here? Who? No, nobody has descendants. They're not here in the room? No. Okay. I'll read the next part. <laughs> <laughs> Albert is a fat blonde, somewhat Falstaffian, and given to broad jokes. I don't think Constance liked him. <laughs> Uncle Nat is a quiet, very capable, and exact looking man. He is tall and a little bent, and says very little. I think that's completely accurate. And the, you know the, this way of walking, you may have seen it. But we see it in my house quite a lot these days. I think it's a hereditary thing. We called at Uncle John's fine house on Sunday and saw Uncle John is which one? No. Don't, no. No, there's no. no. Is he there? JB Herself. Okay. Uncle John. Uh, Okay, everything was pleasant about the visit. Oh, I, there's another fat reference here. We called at Uncle John's fine house on Sunday and saw his fat, pretty wife, Eugenia. <laughs> I think Constance was pretty skinny at that time. Everything was pleasant about the visit. I greatly enjoyed the dear old-fashioned house we stayed in, and I loved Bristol itself and liked all the people. The Herzog tribe are an interesting, brainy crowd. Uncle Lewis and Aunt Sally are interested in everything going on in the world, as well as in the small social interests in the town. They keep open house. Someone's calling every few minutes. Uncle Julian calls on Uncle Lewis several times a day, and then Uncle Lewis returns his calls. 
I played a great deal for the relatives on Uncle Lewis's two grand pianos, and I have run my finger down those pianos. I hope they're still in tune. They're still over there, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I read often to the blind people from the outlook, the newspapers and other things. The outlook was for the, for the blind. Aunt Sally explained all the old things to me. Although she can't see, she knows about every old piece of furniture in the house, all the old china and the books and pictures. Mm -hmm. She showed me the old family miniatures. Um, we have seen those. They, they, um, they are, I believe, in the Brown, John Brown house now. Are they still there? The miniatures? The miniatures of Carl Friedrich and Sarah? You know, the, the two little oh, miniatures. Oh, 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 oh. Right, I think oh. Norman loaned them to the John Brown, to the, the Rhode Island Historical Society. Um, she showed me the old family miniatures. I enjoyed looking through the books and reading the things written on the fly pages a hundred years back. And now we're reading this a hundred years on. Um, there were rows of old spectators. Scarcely anything in the bookcase was younger than 60 years. Aunt Sally's fingers are never idle. She did tatting or knitting constantly. Uncle Lewis told me that she knew two systems of race type for the blind, but that he never bothered with the D slash 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 stuff. <laughs> she is a great friend of the state superintendent of the blind and does a great deal to help her work. It was a great pleasure to see Jim's old home and his relatives. He showed me the house in Burton Street where he lived. That was when he came back from France and went to school in Bristol. The hills he coasted and the woods where he played. Then one morning he showed me the old public squash homestead with its beautiful old furnishings and garden. We drove over in Uncle John's carriage. We called in Uncle Charles's farm. Then we took our baby and drove over the Harrison estate through daisy fields, past the swamp, through woods, and out to a high point where we had a great view of water and country. Jim picked me a wild rose from his ancestral acres. So Jim is still a happy husband at this point. Uh, I loved Bristol, its shaded streets and elms, and old-fashioned houses filled with antique furniture. And, and it's a hundred or so years later, and this Mrs. herself says the same thing. And then, she ends by saying, Uncle Nat took us in his yacht to our boat at Fall River. And um, he, had, he had given a dinner party on his yacht the night before that. And Constance said he smiled a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll quit while I'm still ahead. We may have, have we any more images to show Elizabeth? I can show the images without talking. <laughs> this this was uh, not the 1907 visit I've just described. This was two years later when she had um, another baby. And this is Constance with um, her firstborn child. Now this little girl, James wished to call her Constance Jane Harrisoff after his wife and his mother. He was learning to be diplomatic by this time. Constance won the contest for the names by saying the little girl was to be called Constance Wald Harrisoff after Lillian Wald. And by this time, James had begun to volunteer at the Henry Street Settlement when he had the time, which wasn't too often. And he had grown to respect Lillian Wald just as much as Constance did. And of course, by this time, James was a very close, intimate friend of Jacob Reese. Is that the last one? Yeah, yeah in the middle. This is Constance in middle age when she's become increasingly uh, famous as a composer as well as a concert pianist. And you can see how she looks in, I would say, her mid 40s. Uh, she continued to concertize until she was in her early 60s, which is a good age for a, a woman pianist. Um, she had to stop because she had a hereditary disorder called Depuitrin's contraction. contraction, which makes your hands claw-like. Mm -hmm. And of course it was a catastrophe for a pianist. That's when she became a, a music critic. This is the opening night of the touring Metropolitan Opera in the 
Opera House in San Diego. These are the very well-dressed people entering the auditorium. Constance by this time was well into her late 60s. And by that time she'd become a, a much loved eccentric in San Diego. She believed in dressing for comfort. Mm. So she would show up for uh, very fancy concerts in what we would call sneakers and comfortable clothes. And uh, she wore the same little sequined hat and the same old jacket and, and skirt for 20 years. <laughs> and so fr mutual friends told her that the Opera Guild ladies were so miffed with her they were going to ask the newspaper to send somebody else to do the review of the opening night of the Met. And that was just too much for Constance Mills' hair song. So she had a chat with a friend who was with the Shakespeare Company in San Diego. And uh, they concocted a plan to get revenge on those women. Constance, now Constance couldn't have known she was going to have a Scottish daughter-in-law, but somewhere in the back of her mind she must have got a message saying so because she thought she would like to dress as Mary Queen of Scots. And this is the outfit that the acting company had for a, a Mary Queen of Scots opera production, I think. Some Germans said Mary Queen of Scots made an opera. Uh, she had with her um, Lord Darnley, who was either Mary Queen of Scots um, boyfriend or husband, depending on whether you asked to see the marriage certificate or not. And he, you can't see him in this photograph because he is at the end of her 18 foot long gold lamy and green velvet train. <laughs> Constance walked down the center aisle of the, the theater, slowly, got to where she usually sat, you know, in the front row to do her review, turned around and gave a cold little, <laughs> took out her notebook and pencil and sat down and got on with her work. And she brought the house down. And so I thought, I thought I would finish with that one. I think that's the last one. Well, uh, that's me. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know whether I was going to show it or not. I really intended to keep it for another minute. But that's okay. um, people sometimes ask me, you know, I come from the Firth of Clyde, which some of you may know is where Sir Thomas lived and uh, had his boats built and, and had the tryouts and so on. And um, when I was three, my father decided it was high time I learned what a tiller was for. So this was an old lifeboat that my father got off a ship that was being demolished for scrap. The lifeboat was in pretty good condition. And he and his uncle William, between them, built what my father always proudly called a cabin cruiser. <laughs> and uh, you can see what it's like from this. <laughs> but I distinctly remember having that photograph taken because I was amazed how heavy how heavy this piece of wood was, and I, at first I couldn't get it to move. My father said I couldn't use both hands because that wasn't the proper way to do it, so I had to work at it until I got it. And the day I, this is the day we actually left the dock and, and did it for real, and he managed, I managed to move the tiller and he got the photograph. <laughs> now, I'm finished. Um, I want, uh, I'll just very quickly tell you that we in another little village and they were trying to get some way to get tourists to come and increase prosperity in the village and the local newspaper editor came up with a cockamamie idea that they would try to get into the Guinness Book of World Records and then if they get into that, that people would be intrigued and they would come. So then the town council had a tremendous big debate. Um, what will we try to use as a gimmick to get into the Guinness Book of World Records? The town council had no imagination. You know what town councils can be like. <laughs> and so the newspaper editor said, well, why don't we have a poet laureate? Now, they thought that was great, that the only village in Canada with under 10,000 inhabitants who had its own poet laureate. Now, this happened. The following summer, the government in Ottawa sent some flunky up from, from Ottawa, 
uh, with a proclamation and he came wearing his morning suit and we had it in the park. I think it was for Canada Day, which is like the 4th of July, and a scroll was presented to the guy who was named Poet Laureate. And that's my husband, David. tribute to my mother in a ceremony of her burial in that year. And in it I attempt to weave together the sense of a place and the history of the place and the experience that people feel who live there. North of Mission Bay, the Japanese truck farmed until the soldiers drove them east during the Pacific War. Now this land for Navy housing and a drive-in theater. 200 years ago, the Stone Age ended here. The Spaniards to swell the shepherd's flock marched north and raised the village where her house now stands. Dig in the ground and you will find shards and flints the hurry Indians left behind when herded out of their world by a rod and stack of fine Toledo steel. Constance, willing to know about this underground past, preferred watching the land's living natives, unpretentious plants and birds. She disliked what men have done to the land and each other. From her window she could see the drive-in movie screen's weird distortion of humanity. That screen defaces hills where her children climb to find wild honey in a badger hole. Her sisters and her brother live here still, and most of her brood of six. We are keening now. My mother, her mother, holding daughter Constance by the hand, died here long since. The family lives here because Yankees seized from Mexico what Mexicans removed from Spanish kings, whose missionaries drove the Indians east. Our bloodier century is two-thirds done. Before this century began, many a handsome man called Constance Cactus Cunning. The suitors loved her looks and feared her tongue. She was so succulent and spiny. When young and strong, she strode in the open air through foothills under the desert sun, and the sun caught sparkles from her maize gold hair. Indoors, she sparkled on in music and in talk. She married a passionate man, lived restlessly and for a long time, straining to write well and meet the deadline on her newspaper. Into her early age, she wrote reviews and moved and talked with constant elegance till she was helpless. She was our pride. Sometimes she met defeat within the kitchen. Yeah. Always she made triumphant music in the house to fool the blow. Finally a matriarch, Kantan, her children's children lisped her name. Her hair, though never graying, dull from gold to brown. With a hot wind the sun came from Imperial Valley one October. Constance felt the stroke of her autumnal lover. She sweltered in the death rig her fail Hogan, her frail Hogan, and shriveled up like pemmican and maize, prepared for Indian journeys through the hills. The searing desert radiance said, come, and Constance came. Jesse, of this extraordinary program, and I wonder if there are some questions that people would like to ask of you to uh, fill in some details. 
I think the talk was uh, unique here and fascinating. I personally have to admit, I'm a little mixed up on the genealogy. Some of us are too. Ask your brother. Yeah, we all know. Uh, are there any, any questions or thoughts for Jesse? Yes. Well, I know she said she wasn't going to tell, but did he marry Louise? <laughs> and if not, did she marry the 38 year old? Are you going to tell? <laughs> well, I think um, the video of this is going to be screened at the Reef Center after this. And my good friend Holly Bailey, who is the acting director of the Reef Center, um, <clears throat> may want to keep that a secret until. Um, the publicity over the publication of this marvelous book dies down a little bit. But twist my arm and I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, no, Louise did marry um, Euclid Reeves. They lived a happy, happy life together. I believe it was for almost 25 years. Um, one of the the Bristol uh, Harrisoff ladies, uh, Natalie, who died not too long ago. Um, I, I interviewed her. I interviewed lots of people to find out, you know, background information. Natalie told me that she and Norman sometimes used to go and visit uh, Louise and Euclid in Providence, where they lived. And Natalie said to me rather wistfully one time, she said, "Oh, her husband is so attentive and and so." Uh, uh, helpful to her, uh, Natalie said, it must be wonderful to have a man like that. Mm -hmm. So based on that, I would say it worked out pretty well. And um, and the reason that, uh, by the way, um, Louise outlived the young man, just by, just by a few months. And um, he had left everything, he assuming that he would outlive her, had left everything to Washington and Lee University. He was an alumnus of that great university, but he died first, but uh, when Jim uh, Whitehead uh, came uh, to the funeral of Euclid, um, uh, Louise was very, very ill at the time, but she took his hand, I believe she took his hand and said, I, I will carry out my husband's wishes. He would have wished Washington and Lee to have uh, the porcelains. Uh, she had several thousand priceless Chinese export porcelain pieces. But nobody knew at that time there were about 80 paintings stacked in attics and basements. They, they had so much stuff in one house they had to buy or build one next door for all the things they had. So it wasn't until many, many months after the porcelains went to Washington and Lee, they, they set up a whole new department of ceramics uh, because of that gift, because it was one of the most splendid collections anywhere, anytime. And, uh, and it wasn't until they, they got around to looking at some of the other stuff they discovered the paintings. Mm -hmm. So now they have the Reeves, uh, the Reeves Center, it's the porcelains. Of course, they can only show a few of them at a time. And then they have on display, I'm just guessing, you have say 20 to 30 of the paintings which they can rotate. At different times. I'd like to add just one anecdote <laughs> about the Chinese export porcelain. Can people hear that? Mm -hmm. What yes. happened was that the Chinese had a monopoly on this sort of porcelain, and people in the, in America and Europe had to send little requests over there for for the Chinese to make the stuff and then send it back. And the most hilarious piece of exhibition in in the university in Virginia of Chinese export porcelain is a huge serving platter. And it represents the signing of the Declaration of Independence, a familiar picture, you know, these people sitting around the table with their periwigs. And it's exactly like the painting, except for one thing, that Washington and Jefferson and all those other people have slant eyes. <laughs> Chinese assumed that the painting was accurate. So. <laughs> Jesse, don't you have a, one of Louise's paintings is the cover of the book, is it not? Just to show how vibrant the colors were, if you open up the book. Oh, yeah. no, uh, is that Just, it? Can you see the color? Um, no. I, yes, I, I have stuff laid out here. You're welcome to browse. We're going to have a little informal walk around our 
I think we're having cookies or something. And I have stuff here. You're welcome to look at anything here. And also, Elizabeth has set up at the back there some other things on a board. And uh, if you want to chat with me informally about anything there, I'd be very delighted to talk with you. Um, and I'm leaving. I'm leaving this copy here so you can hold it and, and just glance at it. Um, it's the only copy I have. Anything else? Yes. Is there a catalog of her paintings that yeah. WNL has put out? Yes, they have. They have at different times done wonderful things <laughs> with with that. There's a a marvelous um, catalog of mostly of the porcelains, which came out, uh, I'm trying to think, sometime about two years ago, I believe. Um, and then there are catalogues of her paintings. I have one here tonight, I believe. You can look at it. Um, I'm not too sure. I think that you can buy the catalogues. Uh, I, believe, I believe they still have them for sale. They keep, people keep asking for them, and I think they keep bringing out more. I, I'd have to check on that, but I believe you can. I, you would uh, probably have to contact them. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Jesse, one thing occurs to me, you know, uh, among as many activities, this museum often uh, organizes a trip where members go and go to uh, Australia, New Zealand, and England, and all that. But what if we could organize a trip with you as the guy down to Washington and Lee? When are we going? <laughs> <laughs> Next spring. Oh. Would you be the guy for that? Yes, yes. Uh, well, Holly Bailey, um, Holly Bailey is, is uh, wonderful at that. I would be the guy, though, if you like, uh, you know, chatting to people. Um, Holly Bailey had intended to come here. She and I were going to do a co presentation. And she had accepted and had been invited, of course, by the, the museum board in Halsey. She had to cancel because she was required there for some, I, I don't know what it was, but something very important she was required to be on hand, so that's why she couldn't come. But she sends her very best regards to this museum. And she feels that because, uh, and I believe Halsey also feels that because the two institutions have this extraordinary painter who's a Harrisoff in common and and uh, we here in I'm saying we but you know we here in Bristol have uh, many of the documents and the artifacts and and the, the things that flesh out the human being at Washington and Lee they have the magnificent collection of things beautifully displayed and she feels and I feel that um, the two institutions could have some kind of um, I don't know, little partnership of some kind going. And I think if um, I think if this comes to fruition, I'll certainly come. Well, uh, thank you very much. And thank you, David, for bringing Jesse to Bristol. And uh, thank you for your wonderful research. And we await the book. And please, in the back of the book, between you and David and Nat, you can maybe put in a little genealogy chart. <laughs> stand up, would be great. Uh, I, I think it's uh, very special to have such insight into uh, members of this family. Mm -hmm. uh, some people say there used to be characters in this family. I'm glad none of us are characters today. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's so much fun to. Uh, recognize the things, well, we might have a few characters here. <laughs> it's so much fun to recognize the uh, extraordinary things that a lot of them did, and this is a part that we're so pleased that you brought to us. Thank you. Next month, uh, we will have a lecture of a somewhat different note. It's going to be by uh, uh, Rich Wilson and uh, his partner, who this past year, in the catamaran, broke the record sailing from Hong Kong to New York City. Uh, of course, the old record was uh, held by one of the clipper ships, and um, they decided to try to break it, and they very narrowly succeeded. And it's an extraordinary trip of two gentlemen on uh, 
range of many weeks on a catamaran through a wild southern ocean and around the bottom of South America and on up to uh, finally get to New York. And thank goodness they did break the record after all that effort. What is the date of that? Do you remember? August 3rd. August 3rd. So it's pretty soon. And uh, I hope you all will join us for that. Thank you, Nat, for all you've done to help Jesse. And, uh, I have one more comment. Yes, Nat. I said there were, uh, I haven't thanked you. And you have one more comment. All right, Nat. Louise is deaf you. Guido Borgiani is a very famous artist in Italy. And he's still painting, and he's 89 years old. So we have, uh, that's another artist in the family. By the way, that the business of the cousins, that was third cousin once removed. <laughs> 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 explain that there's a whole segment on Sarah which I had intended to include tonight and for technical reasons I wasn't able to get to it but Sarah had a, an extremely interesting life after the, you know the brief things I mentioned about her there and Nat is the one who can tell you all of it but a full description of Sarah's life is in my book thanks to Nat. Now the, the thing I forgot to do, or almost forgot to do, is, is thank the very many people in Bristol who gave me so much help, not only for this little talk, but at different times over the years when I would have nosy questions about having to do with what was going on at a certain time. And everybody, Halsey, Nat, everybody, um, especially the great Mr. Canero, who is no longer with us, Carlton, um, was a big help to me also, and, and I, I just like to mention him tonight because he was, he was the best. Um, here I um, wish to thank, uh, and now I just have to read these quickly, they all did great things. Bill Knowles, Bonnie Blue, and there's a Scottish song called Bonnie Blue Bell, and I'm going to send Bonnie Blue a copy of it. Uh, Elizabeth Middleton, who, who, was, who was just great, thank you Elizabeth. Terry and Tony Suta, the marvelous people who came to Providence Airport and our luggage was sort of mislaid and, and they were so patient and they brought us safely back to Bristol. Thank you very much. Nat and Carl Harrison, of course, Halsey. Frida Harrisoff, who's been wonderful. We stayed with us three nights on this visit and uh, the only disappointment of the evening is that Frida was unable to be with us tonight. And uh, of course, I want to thank David. <laughs> Thank you all very much, and uh, I think some of you might like to avail yourselves an opportunity with Jesse to look at some of the uh, documents she has yet, and we have some refreshments. Thank you all so much. <laughs>